Radical Israeli leftist pilots went on to 60 Minutes this week and said that they were told to deliberately kill children. Uh huh. But on the other hand, Prime Minister Netanyahu went to San Jose and met with the man he referred to as the almost president of the United States, or the, sorry, the unofficial president of the United States. We'll have details about both and how they come together in In Focus coming up. So this week, everybody who's anybody is in the United States, which I guess makes me nobody here in Jerusalem, but not to worry. At any rate, we had uh, 60 Minutes, Leslie Stahl, who's always happy to talk to anybody who's going to talk dirt about Israel. She did a whole segment on the so-called protests. That's, of course, the left's insurrection and political war against the government of Israel and the 2.5 million Israelis who voted it into office. Uh, So Leslie Stahl had this whole thing with the uh, shock forces of the leftist Stalinist revolution. You know, the brothers in arms who have now made themselves politically palatable for the progressives in the United States who watch 60 Minutes. Now they call themselves brothers and sisters in arms. Anyway, so wearing their olive drab T-shirts, they got up on uh, 60 Minutes talking to Leslie Stahl and they said, what? Well, this female helicopter pilot said, With all due earnestness, this is the direct quote, if you want pilots to be able to fly and shoot bombs and missiles into houses knowing they might be killing children, they must have the strongest confidence in the people making those decisions. And then and then and then the the other guy sitting next to her, uh, who's uh, from a commando unit, uh, has already refused to serve in reserves. But whatever he said, uh, yes, they're moral fiber. So the guy refusing to serve in the IDF is now saying we need people with moral fibers or whatever like his uh, and hers. But uh, here's the problem with what they said. Uh, nobody in Israel on any side of the political spectrum ever gives pilots orders to kill children. That just never happened. Now, there are children who have regrettably been killed uh, in the course of aerial bombing because they're being used as, he- as human shields and the pilots in the cockpits don't know that they're there and neither do the planners and neither do the commanders who order the bombing. They know that they're going to kill terrorists or whatever high-value target happens to be that they're being directed to uh, obliterate from the air. But nobody in the history of the state of Israel on any side of the political spectrum has ever or would ever give a pilot in the Israel Air Force an order to deliberately kill children. And by the way, uh, the Supreme Court has nothing to do with any of these operational decisions at any level of the decision-making chain of command in the army and from the government down to the army and back up again. So it's all a complete lie. Yes, it's true that children on the enemy's side of the fence have been killed by uh, Israeli pilots and other Israeli forces in the course of battle because that's the nature of warfare today when you're fighting against the terrorist organizations whose doctrine has him use civilians on his side as human shields and has him directly uh, uh, and has him deliberately attacking and bombing civilians on the other side because They view civilians, A, as targets when they're Jews, and B, as cannon fodder when they're on their side. That's why Hamas sets up its mental batteries in hospitals and in schools, orphanages, and anything else, civilian neighborhoods that they can find. Hezbollah does the same thing. The PLO did the same thing when they were in Lebanon, and the same thing today in Judea and Samaria. It's just the way that they fight. So yes, it's true that we have had children regrettably killed, and Israel has always been apologetic about it because it's not our way of war. But here you have these leftist radicals from the brothers and now sisters in arms going to, on to network television in the United States and just lying, plain out lying and demonizing the state of Israel. And it's really interesting, right? Because the we've talked about brothers in arms repeatedly on this show. Here in Israel, they are the shock forces. They're the ones who are standing in front of the ministers, beating ministers, it was brothers-in-arms people 
who used a flag of Israel to beat agricultural minister Abi Difter when he was coming out of an event, and they hit him on the head. Uh, it's the brothers in arms people with their flags of Israel, right? That they wield like weapons because they're, you know, they're fighters, right? And they use them to uh, bash in the windshields of women who are stuck on the highway because they're blocking the highways with their children who they just picked up from school or angry motorists who come out of their cars to yell at them and tell them to move aside so that they can go on about their business. So they beat them with them. So these are the shock troops. These are the ones who barricaded the offices of the Kohelet Forum, the right-wing think tank, who then they were the shock forces in all the assault on Arthur Danchik, Kohelet's main uh, uh, phoner, funder, who was, who was uh, enabling, uh, God forbid, conservative thinkers in Israel to actually use the democratic process to work with policymakers and politicians to advance uh, their common goals through legislation and through government policy. So they barricaded their offices with barbed wire. They attacked Kohelet, um, Kohelet uh, uh, scholars outside of their homes, in restaurants, and anywhere they could find them to demonize and dehumanize them in order to make people feel like they couldn't have anything to do with Kohelet's message, which is why, by the way, this this year in Tel Aviv and Ramadan, I think you had these radical leftist principals who were demanding or returning their citizenship books or social studies books because they were written by Kohelet scholars. You wouldn't want any of their terrible Zionist ideals to be you know, inculcated or taught, God forbid, to school teachers in in these in these people's schools because, you know, they, they don't want anything to do with Judaism and the schools of the Jewish state. Uh, and, and this is brothers in arms at home. So they're, they're violent shock troops of the Stalinist revolution that, that, is, uh, the, uh, that is the underlying concept behind the left's efforts to use violence, mob violence, riots, etc., uh, and intimidation and ostracism in order to try to destabilize the government, paralyze the government, and ultimately oust the government and replace it with a government or a regime that they have full control over. So that's brothers in arms in Israel. In America, what we've seen with 60 Minutes and uh, uh, is that they're they're adopting sort of a different tactic. They're, they're adopting sort of the tactic of two different kinds of organizations. On the one hand, you have J Street. So they're coming out as these nice Israeli Jews, boys and girls who were officers and these commando units and the Israel Air Force, pilots, etc., and they're just, you know, suffering from moral angst because Israel has has lost its way. And their job as Israelis is to explain how evil Israel is and get people to mobilize on behalf of demonizing Israel, weakening Israel, and compelling Israel to do things that the majority of Israelis who don't have souls, the soulless religious Jews, etc., and and BB voters, etc., you know, they have to be forced to accept that their ways are aired and, and move toward a different direction. So they're going out like J Street does. They're sort of as a Jew, Jews or as Israeli Israelis say that they're really embarrassed and, you know, they, they, they're they good people. It's just the rest of us that suck. And then you have the B'Tselem strategy of the Israeli NGOs, the so-called human rights groups that go out to the UN and, and tell, or the European Parliament or or wherever, and to squad at the U.S. Congress and talk to them about how evil Israel is. So they're actually just sort of anti-Israel groups that go out into the world to demonize Israel in the name of human rights, of course. So that, you know, the the fake uh, orders to hurt children, right, that's the B'Tselem of uh, breaking the silence sort of way of doing things, of going out and demonizing Israel and they're wearing these khaki shirts so that, you know, they're actual soldiers, right? Because, you know, nobody else wears olive drab t-shirts, but whatever. So that's what that's what they do. And they also say that we're ads Israeli Israelis coming out and telling American Jews just how terrible Israel is and going on to CBS and slandering uh, the army. One of the bothersome things, maybe the main one, is that we haven't heard any IDF commander coming out and condemning them, which, you know, speaks to really Uh, the sorry state of the general staff of the IDF, that they haven't done that. I guess the last thing I I can't, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, which is that at home, not only are they the shock troops attacking people physically in their homes and in their offices and in restaurants and so on and so forth, 
but they also are are the shock forces that are demanding that uh, Israeli officers uh, in reserves, uh, commandos in reserves, etc., not serve in the IDF, so that they've been tearing apart or seeking to tear apart the IDF. You know, some patriotism, right? You just go up uh, to reservists and you tell them not to serve in the IDF. You know, that the IDF's whole doctrine of defending the country is based on uh, calling up the reserves in emergencies, and and they're saying, no, 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 don't don't come. Uh, uh, in the name of patriotism, don't come. In the name of democracy, you know, reject the right of the duly elected government to, to, um, to to serve. Um, and then, and why are they doing all of this? And that's really the big kicker: is that uh, the same female Air Force pilot who said that uh, she gets orders to kill children, which is a complete and utter again, this is a blood libel against the state of Israel. So she also said in in a different segment of her interview with the anti-Israel Leslie Stahl, she said that, you know, ultimately we need to protect democracy, that is, reject the right of Israeli voters to choose their government by overthrowing it and demonizing it, but that's democracy, whatever. So she says, we need democracy in order to end the occupation. And as I wrote in my column last Friday, which I urge you all to read if you haven't yet, it's called A Prayer for 5784. That's this new year that we just celebrated Rosh Rosh Hashanah for. That, you know, really the the thing that's most uh, notable about the whole, the left's whole thing is that what they really want to do, and I talked about this uh, this week on the Carolyn Glick Show with my friend Gadi Tab, who is my guest, uh, and you should check that out too, is that ultimately what they want to do is end the Jewish identity of the state of Israel. They're, they're done with that. So how do they do that? They do that by asserting a contradiction between Jewish and democratic that you know, if you're too Jewish, then you're not democratic. But really, and I think Gotti said it beautifully on the show this week. He said, "Look, you know, uh, a national self determination means that you know you're you have a nation, and in this case, it's the Jewish nation. So when we have democracy, then we're more Jewish because what sort of state would a bunch of Jews who are together want to have? Well, a Jewish state because that's who we are. So." When we're determining our own fate at the ballot box in our lives, then we're doing it in a Jewish way because we're Jewish. And so the idea that you would have a Jewish state or would have a democracy in a country of Jews that isn't a Jewish democracy is a a contradiction of terms. You can't have a democracy here unless it's Jewish. And so really the assault in the name of democracy is saying you want to protect democracy against the Jews, what you're really wanting to do is begin tyranny in order to oppress the Jews, in order for Israel not to be a Jewish state. And you do that through this concept of occupation by saying that there's something morally impaired about Israeli control over the Jewish heartland of Judea and Samaria, over Israeli sovereignty in in Jerusalem, our capital for the past 3,000 years. So the idea is to say that there's something immoral about Jewish nationalism about Jewish national self-determination and that in order to end that immoral situation, you have to oppress the Jews in the name of democracy, but really you use the term democracy in order to destroy it, which brings me to something really amazing that happened yesterday, which I wrote about in a column that came out uh, at JNS. You got to check out uh, Netanyahu's Twitter gambit that came out on uh, Tuesday morning, I think, which is that you know, Netanyahu's meeting with Elon Musk sort of raised a lot of eyebrows. The leftist media in Israel tried to demean him, say, well, why did he fly all the way to San Jose? I mean, Elon Musk flew to New York in order to meet with Turkish uh, President uh, Recep Erdogan. And here is Netanyahu making the pr- pilgrimage to uh, uh, San Jose to Tesla in order to meet with Elon Musk. And they didn't understand anything at all, as per usual, right? Our media is brain dead, and also they're just propagandists. So they'll say anything to try to make Netanyahu look like a loser. But the move to San Jose was really a stroke of brilliance. And and I'm not going to go through the whole article here because you're going to read it. But also the the basic underlying concept was, you know, here's Netanyahu. He's being attacked as illegitimate by these liars, you know, saying that Israel conducts war crimes or whatever in uh, brothers and sisters in arms. And 
So they're saying that Israel is evil and bad and that they're the dem Democrats by rejecting the democratic will of the people. And here comes Netanyahu. Netanyahu comes to Elon Musk and ostensibly in order to talk about artificial intelligence and Netanyahu's plans to make Israel a world leader in AI. And AI, I mean, my husband and I argue about this. He thinks it's great and I think it's terrifying and anti-human and, you know, not just like any, whatever. So that's basically the heart of the concern about AI. Of course, it can do an extraordinary things. And on the other hand, can do extraordinarily horrible things. And this was really the heart of the conversation that Netanyahu had with Musk, and I would assume off camera, but certainly on camera in this really extraordinary one-on-one -on -one they had. And then in this larger roundtable discussion that they had with, you know, two other geniuses, the head of open AI and some other guy, Who's like just really smart and makes makes us all feel little and small. But um, here was Netanyahu. He comes in. He's the prime minister of Israel now in his sixth term. He was democratically elected. He got a commanding mandate from the people, 64 mandates uh, after four inconclusive elections. This is a commanding uh, victory. At any rate, so he comes there as the democratically elected leader of Israel. And you see this affable, really smart, um, totally competent on his game, gets the most complex concepts now challenging humanity in terms of AI. And he's having this uh, tete a tete with, with, uh, with Elon, Elon Musk, who's just, you know, a genius. And then they bring in these two other geniuses. And so you see, you know, what an extraordinary result you can get from a democracy that you can produce a leader like Netanyahu of his caliber, and also that he's so concerned about the country and establishing us as a global leader in AI, et cetera. So first of all, you saw just, you know, this is this is the real leader of Israel. You know, all these people, this cacophonous uh, these, this cacophony of screamers screaming shame, shame, shame in New York City when at just at the side of his uh, convoy coming to his, uh, his, his hotel uh, and then making these lies about the, the army and then back home, you know, uh, attacking people on the streets because they want to get to work and, you know, interrupt their blocking of the highways, etc. You know, on the one hand, and then this guy. Netanyahu, he comes into uh, Tesla headquarters and and he has this conversation and it was amazing. And also, you know, it's so important really to mobilize Musk and, you know, uh, as he harnesses Israel's capability in the field of AI because Musk is the wealthiest person in the world and he is in a way the unofficial president of the United States because he has so much power and so much money. So that was important. The other thing that was important is that in the one on one, Elon Musk, actually Elon Musk, sorry, gave Netanyahu the floor uh, in in explaining, making his case for judicial reform, for the legitimacy of his government, for democracy in Israel, what democracy really is, checks and balances and all the rest of it, limited powers on all three branches of government and not judicial supremacy, which is what the left is pushing for and trying to demonize his government because it, it doesn't want to maintain in Israel. So he got the floor, you know, and and I don't know. I mean, it's already got like six, 17 million views or something like that, which is way more than he could get even on a Fox News interview. I mean, Elon Musk, Elon Musk is the most powerful man in the media in the world today because he controls Twitter and Twitter is the town hall of humanity. It's the great leveler, more than Facebook, which is where everybody's just in his little nook and you can come or not come and read somebody's post, except if you're trying to read Carolyn, because I've been behind, you know, <laughs> a firewall and they block me away since like 2015 when they just, you know, erased 90 percent of the traffic to my side. And so it, I stopped really posting there because who cares? They're not letting anybody read me. So I, I mainly do Twitter. Um, and Twitter is a place where, you know, anybody can challenge anybody. So you can challenge Netanyahu, you can challenge Elon Musk, you can challenge anybody. And, you know, so long as they're not censoring, and ostensibly the censorship has gone way down since Musk uh, bought Twitter from the people who were colluding with the government on COVID-19 and Hunter Biden laptop and all the rest of it, um, you know, he's trying to restore 
freedom of speech in Western civilization at a time when it's coming under greater and greater stress and threat from the woke and from all kinds of government agencies that are colluding with uh, the big media, the social media organizations to block people from having that right to express themselves. Um, so that he, you know, he, this man who is probably the most important figure in freedom of speech in the, I would argue, even though we're only in 2023, probably in the 21st century, Musk, he's giving a, a platform to Netanyahu, something that he can never get on the Israeli media. And because of the machinations of the Israeli media that whose poison is, you know, directing, is getting directly pumped into the bloodstream of the media in the United States because they just, you know, they just plagiarize from what they read in the Jerusalem Post, which has gone completely, by the way, over the top in terms of its mobilization on behalf of the left in Israel. And so they read Israeli media, Haaretz, Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel, translations of Yediot or Ma'ariv or Israel Ayom or Haaretz, of course. And, you know, the, you get it all back in the New York Times and Leslie Stiles. So, you know, here comes Netanyahu and he makes the case without Musk interrupting him. So that was important. That was incredibly important because in one fell swoop, he... After all of these months of being demonized, he arrives in the United States. His first stop is Tesla, meets with Musk, does his forum. He reasserts his his bona fides as Israel's legitimate leader, democratically elected. He makes the case for democracy against all of the naysayers. He makes all of the people with a horrible projection ads on the U.N. building saying that he's the crime minister and that he shouldn't be listened to and uh, putting him in an orange jumpsuit and saying, welcome to Alcatraz Bibi at, at, when he lands in San Francisco. You know, all of these people suddenly look irrelevant and small and and are exposed really as liars because look at this incredible guy. Look at this leader that we just uh, reelected again and look at the way that he's able to manage a conversation with probably among the most brilliant people on the face of the planet. And and he's able to make in two minutes the case for Israeli democracy, democratic rule, limited powers of all three arms of government, and the case for you know what he's trying to do in reaching consensus. So I think that was incredible. He just leapfrogged over the Israeli media. He leapfrogged over the anti-Israel mainstream media in the United States. And he spoke directly to millions of people that he would never have been able to reach, and he made the case which is also important going forward because we do actually have enemies. You know, the, the the pilots in the Israel Air Force are sent to bomb things because we have a lot of targets. We are the target of a lot of horrible actors all around us, and they're being directed now mainly by Iran, whose president, Ibrahim Raisi, just landed. He's sanctioned by the U.S. He's land because he's a murderer. He's killed thousands and thousands of people, directly ordered their murder as the Iran's chief prosecutor in the 1980s, now as president, uh, killing more thousands of Iranian freedom protesters in the Mahsa Amini uh, protests that are now reaching their first anniversary this week. And he's just, you know, treated like a normal head of state. Mayan Airlines, the Iranian airline, which is also under sanctions because of its actions in proliferating weapons of mass destruction and terrorism, you know, they took him to New York as if this was, a, you know, a United Airline flight or whatever. And he's going to go speak at the U.N. and he's going to sell out his lies and talk about how Israel has no right to exist. And Mahmoud Abbas, who just gave a Nazi speech in Ramallah and then, you know, repeated it again because that's just who he is and what he does. You know, he's going to be treated there like a king, like royalty. So Netanyahu, though, because he stopped in San, San Jose and made his pilgrimage, as the Israeli media said to Elon Musk, you know, now he's coming to New York after he's reasserted his legitimacy and his luminous brain and his real ability to, to lead the country, which elected him to be our leader. And so he's going to meet with all of these world leaders, including Erdogan and Zelensky from Ukraine, etc., and the German Chancellor Schultz and others, and then Biden. And he's going to be in a completely different position. And by the way, and then after he's met with Biden, he's going to give a speech. And he's going to give a speech, and he's not going to give a speech about democracy in Israel. I hope, anyway. I think he's going to finally be able, after having done all of this, to give the speech at the GA that you would expect an Israeli prime minister to give. 
which is to warn the, the world, including the United States of America, that they're enabling Iran, the, this genocidal country that has, you know repeats every day that it wants to annihilate the Jewish state to become a nuclear armed state, and that Israel's going to be taking action to block it. Period. And he's going to say that, and you know, hopefully, he'll say something about Palestinian Holocaust denial and why these people can't be allowed to be given a sovereign state. Uh, in Israel's heartland and blocking our ability to defend ourselves from foreign aggression or from Palestinian aggression, for that matter. And he'll be able to give that speech after he's taken control of the conversation. And just one last word about his upcoming meeting with Biden. You know, Elon Musk or Elon Musk is seen, you know, in a way as 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 uh, Biden's bet noir because he has enabled free speech on Twitter and he's enabled so many of the lies about whether it's COVID-19 and the lockdowns, or more importantly, from Biden's personal perspective, Hunter Biden's illegal actions to come out on his platform. And um, so just for that, for being a true Democrat and being for freedom of speech, people on the left view him as this evil, you know, master, you know, like Dr. Evil or whatever. And, uh, and so Netanyahu going to San Jose and meeting with him and calling him, here I remember the term, the unofficial president of the United States, sort of, it, it's, he ends up acting as a foil for Biden, which is incredibly important because Biden and all of his advisors have been demonizing Netanyahu, siding with these, these blood libelers from, you know, from brothers in arms and all the rest of these shock forces of, of leftist anti-Democrats who want to destroy the Jewish aspect of Israel by undermining its democratic regime and disenfranchising voters, and I could go on and on. So, you know, Biden has been siding with them, and he and his advisors have used them as a reason to refuse to meet with Netanyahu for 10 months, which is incredible. And even now, all of the briefings that they've been giving their Israeli reporters or house reporters from Israeli media organs have been, oh, all we really want to talk about with Netanyahu is his commitment to democracy and the common democratic values that we share in Israel and, and America, meaning that they want to humiliate him and treat him like an illegitimate leader, even though he was the one who was democratically elected here. So we have this whole thing going on. And Netanyahu sort of pulled the rug out from under them by going and meeting with Elon Musk and talking about freedom of speech and giving his pitch for Israeli democracy and and and, and being able to do that um, while going to another center of power in the United States. The United States is a democracy. There are lots of power centers. Elon Musk is the most powerful man in media globally now because he's spent those, what is it, $37 billion to buy Twitter. Um, he paid for his, his position fair and square, and he has it. And he just, he let Netanyahu use that power to give Israel's position. And I think, you know, it was a master stroke. And, um, and we'll just have to, have to see how it plays out, but it certainly made a, a visit that was looking like it was just going to be dreadful and horrible and that these anarchists who are trying so hard to demonize him and through him the state of Israel in order to end the occupation, meaning ending the Jewish state, um, they they may have actually lost this round. And if they did, who knows what's going to happen at the next Knesset session. We'll have to see. But um, I have to say that after watching his, uh, his, his, uh, his meeting with Musk, um, I, I felt for the first time really optimistic, like the boss is back in town. Like finally, you know, we're getting the voice of, of the democratically elected leader of Israel and it's being heard in a very powerful and important way. And there's a lot more to say about this, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to wish you all uh, gemar chatima tova. May you all be sealed in the book of life and uh, may the next year really be one where we get back to uh, fulfilling the promise of this country and going forward uh, as as a force of good we are and uh, be strong. So uh, if you're fasting, have an easy fast, and I'll see you again after, after Yom Kippur next week. Take care. See you soon.